Okay, think of something. The subject isn't really important, just think of whatever you want. Okay, got it? Now, how did that thought get assembled? I mean, if I asked two different people to think about the same thing, they'd each have at least slightly different pictures of it. What's the mechanism that differed? What's the unique process that went into making your particular thought? And also, who besides you was involved in that process? I know, it's a strange question, and based on Swedenborg's field notes, the answer is far stranger still. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg in Life, but it's not just really another episode, it's a weird episode. As you can tell, I'm in a weird white space. I'm standing instead of sitting, hopefully you can tell. And that's fitting because we're going to talk about weird stuff today. If this is your first episode, you might not want to start with this one because it's it's very strange. You might want to check out, um, I guess all the episodes are pretty weird, but this one is extra weird. So proceed at your own risk. And we're going to be looking today into the, the building blocks of thought. Like how does a thought get to be a fully formed concept in someone's head? Why do thoughts occur in certain ways to certain people? If you think about the nature of thought and how it changes the way the world is, the fact that when you mention a certain concept or topic, people get such different pictures of it in their head. These lead people to all kinds of actions. What goes into making up that thought? initially. Well, Swedenborg wrote down a ton of information when he was having his spiritual experiences, and one of the things that he was shocked by was how much the spiritual world interacted with his mental world, way more than he ever anticipated. He said that was one of the hardest things to get used to, and he actually wrote some notes about it that indicated that the spiritual world was intimately um, intertwined with his thought generation process. We're going to look at the specifics of that, but first I want to say that we're not throwing the brain out the window, because if you ask people uh, now where do thoughts come from, they would say, we don't know exactly how, but it's a process in the brain. Somehow the way the neurons are structured and organized, something, something will discover it in a few years, that's where thoughts come from. Swedenborg is not saying the brain has nothing to do with it. It's all spirit. And you can see this by some quotes that he wrote in his books. We have a, our first one from Divine Providence where he t he's responding right now to people who think that the soul isn't um, interacting with the material body. So that's who he's going after. We're really interested in the second part of this. As for thought, they say that it is some change affected in the air, varied according to the objects we perceive and reinforced by habit. So he's going after these people. This means that the concepts of our thoughts are likenesses that we see in the air, like phenomena in the sky, and that our memory is the slate on which they are recorded. Here's what we're going to talk about. They do not realize that our thoughts take place in substances that are intricately organized, just as our sight and hearing take place in their organs. They should look at the brain and they would see a wealth of substances like this. Injure them and you go out of your mind, destroy them and you die. And Swedenborg, pre-theological or spiritual experience period, one of his fields that he was excelling in was anatomy. So he's making the claim that, no, that the structure of the brain matters and this spiritual stuff matters. Because you'll often get people who are, who are um, pushing against the idea of a spiritual influence on thought that will say, uh, we, we know that it's physical because if you mess with the physical side of things, you can affect how people think and feel. So he seems to be advocating for something that's a both and here. He goes on in True Christianity, his book. Again, you can click these, download these books for free and see the context of the conversation. He says, the point here can be more accurately illustrated by the mutual interaction between soul and body. The soul and the body are two distinct things, yet they are reciprocally united. The soul acts on and in the body, but not through it. Instead, the body acts on its own initiative on behalf of the soul. The soul does not act through the body, and the soul and the body do not consult and engage in decision-making with each other. The soul does not command or request the body to do this or that, or say this or that with its mouth. The body does not call for or petition the soul to give it or supply it with something. Everything belonging to the soul belongs to the body, mutually and reciprocally. 
we could easily spend a show or two just on that and what, what is he getting at there. We bring it up today to say, I don't feel like I know, and I don't think anybody working on the program would say that they know for sure how the spiritual and physical in Swedenborg's worldview interact to produce thought, but they do somehow. So we're not saying all the thoughts come from something spiritual, there's nothing physical attached to it. However, we are going to put a lot of importance on the spiritual side of thought creation. And to get to that, to get to his detailed notes on where his own thoughts were were coming from and what they were being affected by, you have to go deep into Swedenborg's writings, even stuff that he didn't ever put out uh, published stuff you couldn't ever find on a bookshelf somewhere. Not that it, a lot of his books are on a lot of bookshelves. We have to go deep into Swedenborg's material. And luckily, there happens to be a place nearby that makes it very easy to do that. So for the first journey in this episode, we're going to take a little trip to the Swedenborg Library. I'm Carol Travany, I'm the library director. We support the mission of Bryn Athen College through our academic services and resources, but we also have the distinction of holding, housing, the largest repository of new church materials and Swedenborgiana in the world. The library is widely recognized as a center of Swedenborgian scholarship and research. We are committed here to making that available to people worldwide. So I'm down there in the archives of the Swedenborg Library, and I've got my hands on, this is obviously not the original journal of spiritual experiences, but it is a lithograph of that. I mean, this is the, this is the picture of the text as it appeared, as he wrote it, complete with all of his markings and everything, the state he left that manuscript in. What is the journal of spiritual experiences? How did we come to have it? What was its function in Swedenborg's world? We just happened to run into Dr. Jonathan Rose on site, and he was gracious enough to tell us a little bit about what we were dealing with. What we're looking today at Swedenborg's Journal of Spiritual Experiences, what is that? Uh, and where did it come from? And, and why was he keeping a journal of all this stuff in the first place? Tell me everything about the journal. After his spiritual eyes were opened, he got very interested in this new sense that he was getting of an inner meaning in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So he started explaining uh, he started writing a draft work that's called the word explained or has various different names in English and he was going through Genesis and Exodus just exploring and seeing what was going on. This is but that's not Secrets of Heaven? That is not Secrets of Heaven. Okay. That's a precursor to Secrets of okay. Heaven. Right. And as he's going along explaining things now and then I want you to see here how on the page all of a sudden, it's indented like half... Paper was very expensive back then. Mm. All of a sudden, you have a passage. This is the word explained here. And all of a sudden, you'll have a passage that's indented like half the page. And he writes like that. And then he goes back to a full margin. Oh, and then he indents again and comes back. Well, what's going on there? Well, what's going on is that he started writing in the midst of this biblical exegesis, he starts to realize how this is connecting with his own spiritual experiences. And he starts to write spiritual experiences in here, and he wants to be able to find them later because he realized yeah. it's not the same material. You know, right. I'm, I'm not explaining the Bible. It might be a connection with the Bible, but I'm talking now about I saw this or this happened to me, and, right. and it's all about his spiritual experiences. So when he's flipping through, you can just quickly, oh, there's my experiences. There, there it is. There's another one. Yeah, mm -hmm. so he can spot them immediately on the page. And he does that all the way through this long work that he never ended up publishing. Then he started to 
realize, you know, rather than sort of tucking them in another book, I should really get out a manuscript and, you know, so he keeps writing. And he doesn't know how long this thing's gonna be, yeah. but he's just writing. It's sometimes, and that's the work that becomes what has sometimes been called the spiritual diary. More recently, it's been more accurately titled spiritual experiences, because yeah. that's, there's some evidence that that's what he thought of it as. And yeah, that's what he I think that's what we call it on the show, is spiritual, spiritual experiences. Experience. That's right, right. It has a diary, you know, right there in front of you. There's a day of, 26th of May in 1749, you yep. know, uh, it, yes, it has a diary feature to it, but what it is, is not just sort of like, I went to the store today, I yeah. bought some lingonberries. Yes. No, he's, what he's talking about. Though he may well have been doing that. He may have been doing okay. that. But what he's recording here are his spiritual experiences. Yes. And I think what he's doing is he's trying to make sense of this amazing, like, you know how it is, like, it, it, I think it was more organized than dreams or something, but sort of this seemingly random thing happens and yep. that, that seemingly random thing. So he wanted to try to organize it and get a handle on it. So he's studying these things and writing about them. So we want to look particularly right now at this entry, 2062, uh, because here he describes this very interesting interaction with spirits and the thoughts in his mind. And he talks a little bit about what actually goes into making a thought. What we want to do is explore this. Can we get, can we discern what he's writing about here, all this crossed out stuff? Do we understand the words, but then also, can we get from this scratch on this page to some truth, some enduring truth about the condition of everyone's mind and get some insight into the building blocks of psychology? We'll take a look. things and the least things are controlled by the Lord, and in every idea and feeling there are countless particulars. This morning I was shown plainly that there are countless particulars in every human idea and slightest feeling. In fact, if it is permitted to say something beyond human belief, the state of the whole world of spirits is similar. I was having a certain feeling and resulting mental image almost continuously over a period of time. And afterwards, I was shown how many societies of spirits had contributed to the mental image resulting from that feeling, which some might regard as a simple, even most simple, idea. The societies of spirits nearest by who were contributing to it revealed themselves by actual conversation, claiming that they were the ones who wanted this thing and were set on it, even explaining for what reason and for what purpose. They did so one after the other. And yet, out of so many thought images of these societies, arising from their desires, longings, and intentions, just one general thought or image came forth within me. How many there were in each society, I was unable to learn, but four or five societies, if not more, revealed themselves by open conversation, openly declaring that they had caused it, and even telling for what purpose. So what was that? Hopefully we're all confused about it together. Was he talking about groups of people and societies? What is all that? Luckily, I had a panel of Swedenborg enthusiasts on hand, and we're going to now go through this bit by bit and hopefully pull out what did he mean by it all and what implications does it have for the way all of us think. we got Spiritual Experiences 2062. What's he talking about? What's happening here? What do you guys see in the text? Because it, it can be a little vague at points. So it, let's look at this first little section here. W what's happening to Swedenborg? Jonathan, do you, do you have any sense of that? I think in the heading you see the main idea, which is that in every idea and feeling there are countless particulars, and not only particulars, but there's influences, like right. from outside of himself. So particulars being like particular elements? Right. Yeah, yeah, and influences Details, and so on. Details, maybe. And okay. It, it, it's incredible to think about um, how he's getting a, a glimpse that no one's ever seen before, I think, of how a, for, a thought forms or how yeah. a feeling 
formed, where they come from, and what that is. Yeah, like if you got your thought at Ikea, here's the little book, and here's how you put this part <laughs> with this part. And That's he was right. saying that, that those pieces were coming from all over the place. Right? All over even, the place. even the simplest thought that you might have is actually this huge depth and, and like threads reaching out in so many different directions in the spiritual world is what seems like he's if, saying. If you had credits on your thought, they would roll for 20 <laughs> minutes, you know, That's just like yeah. all the people. A huge conglomeration of individual ideas. And he makes that point uh, with a lot uh, that there's there's greater within that there's a uh, you know millions of celestial things within one spiritual thing millions of spiritual things mm. and he likens that to physical objects. This looks like one microphone, but if you zoomed into a molecular level, it's mm. tons and tons of stuff. So the same thing mm. with thoughts. Um, and but what's this? Societies of spirits are contributing to a mental image. That's normal if you are used to reading uh, you know 18th century spiritism. But what, what's that? So, so he's saying that there are cities in heaven that are manufacturing your, your thoughts? Yeah. Our spirit is part of the spiritual world. I mean, our spirit, meaning our mind and our heart, mm -hmm. is a citizen of the spiritual world already. What I don't know is whether the, and I think the answer is no, do the societies of spirits, are they aware that you're having a thought and that they're contributing something to it? Mm. I think it's just the mechanism, just like you know, millions or billions of neurons fire to give us one thought in our brain. Right. You know, this is sort of the spiritual version of that, whether they, I think it's known to God, but maybe not to those individual spirits that they're contributing to your idea. So it's sort of a, the, the brain is a microcosm of, of the spiritual world. And the, like all these societies, are, and it takes so many cells in any part of the body acting in concert to produce one action. He talks about muscles and how yeah. the, the more cells fire, the, the greater the reaction is. In my case, so many cells <laughs> firing at once. Um, but so that it's like that. And let's, let's look at the second part of this, where it seems, he seems to describe a little bit more how this contribution happens. Well, here it seems like he's he's addressing the society and saying, "Hey, were you part of this thought?" And a few of them are saying, "Yeah, I mean," but it, that it pulls out of um, out of what they're thinking or what they're feeling. Or how do you guys imagine this mechanism working? It's so interesting that it's their desires and longings and intentions. You know, that this is so basic to the human spirit that there are things that you've longed sort of what I really want to see in the world mm. is this. And, you know, what, what I really care about is this. And I'm terribly passionate about that. And, and it's that sort of energy that seems to be coming out of these different societies. And so that each of these different communities are claiming that they were this is my idea, you know, yeah. I oh, wanted yeah. this to mm -hmm. happen, you know, that this, like, I've been dreaming of this, and th this is the fulfillment of what I want. Yeah. Lunch. <laughs> Lunch, right. <laughs> In this case, we had to guess. We don't know exactly what he means by the simplest idea of thought, but it could well be that. It yeah. does seem to, like, go along with how Swedenborg is always, or this, like, understanding of the spiritual world is that, that an experience of identity is such a constant thing. You know, so even though we somehow have this huge shared feeling, shared thought, it always goes along with a sense of, oh, I, you know, I have this purpose for it, or this was yeah. how I caused it. So like that, it's never divided from that. There's always a sense of mm. ownership of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. identity. This is a dumb example, and please cut this, but... Yeah, um, we, can do, we can do that in post. At, at one point when I got a, an advanced degree... There was a party afterwards, and I was amazed that like 12 or 15 people got up and said, this was my idea. And then the next person said, no, this was my idea, you know. And here I was thinking, it was my idea, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 the influence credit. Four or five societies <clears throat> contributed to that. So how many, how many people is that? It may be millions. I mean, he says how many there were in each society, I don't know. But um, I'm thinking that societies amassing people since eternity ago are big. <laughs> and, w and would be even bigger now. I mean, yeah, in Swedenborg's yeah. time, you know, the world population was a lot smaller. So it would continue to grow. And he, he does say it, that moving from the physical world to the spiritual world is like going from a little village to a big city. So I mm -hmm. just imagine the, the amount of activity. And is that partially why the, you've seen the trajectory of the human race. Our ideas get more complex. Our understanding gets more complex. Mm. Is it because there's just more raw material to work with? Mm. More input from the other world, mm. yeah. I don't know. 
we'll find out soon, right? Mm -hmm. And and that what that that could be cool because the thoughts we're thinking now are going to be nothing compared to the thoughts we'll think in a mm -hmm. thousand years, two thousand years, something like that. And that each one of us can be a contributor to the universal human mindset. So let's do it. Mm -hmm. So to recap. Swedenborg was having a thought. Let us let me stand in for him for a second here. We don't know what he was thinking about, but probably this. He was having a thought, and because he had this hyper-awareness of the spiritual world and all the people that were in it, when he was having his thought, he was able to sense somehow or know that there was actually tons and tons of people in all different communities across the spiritual world who were contributing to that thought. That that, that was how he had a thought was that there was material coming from, he said, out of their wants and their desires, and that some of the close ones were claiming, no, we, we, we thought of this, we thought of lunch. And he was actually able to pick apart the, the source of it. Even though it seemed like a really simple idea, he was shown that there's tons of spiritual material coming into that. And because of the nature of these different people in these communities and what they wanted and what they were coming at it from, that changed his idea in the first place. So that his one little simple thought was this huge complex of spiritual material. Much like something simple looking like a human hand has so many systems in it, you, could, you, could, you couldn't learn about them in, the, in a whole four-year degree program entirely, right? So there's a lot going on. He said this complexity extends to the spiritual world and that thoughts are, have some kind of communal aspect to them, all right? So if, you're, if you haven't buckled your seatbelt yet, hopefully you will now, because we're going to go even deeper into it with this next one. We're going to look at the specific motivations that these different communities can have when they're affecting a thought. So let's go back, though, because we're pulling all this out of his Journal of Spiritual Experiences. So let's go back to Dr. Jonathan Rose and I chatting a little more about what this Journal of Spiritual Experiences really is. So that was born out of here. It's, it, it, it's a very interesting thing that it grew up in another book. It was, yep. it, it was like a something, you know, it was like a seedling growing right out of, the, yeah. of another tree or something He wasn't like planning it. He didn't think, all right, oh, well, I need to keep this journal. It just, I can't not keep this journal. That's right. It just was happening to him as he's working on the Bible. So what he does is then, I think again, in an effort to make sense of his spiritual experiences, he writes an index, which I have over here, of his spiritual experiences. Okay. And in order to indicate to future generations, to himself perhaps, but also to future generations, that this stuff is actually part of that. It was Dr. Durbin Odner who made this amazing discovery that, oh, this is part of, he <clears throat> considered this part of his spiritual experiences, even though it was in a separate book, because in his index, he'll say, he indexes this as part of that. Okay. That's how you can tell. Yep. You know, he indexes the whole thing together. Yep. I think what's going on in his index is that he's organizing, categorizing. He's had such an amazing mind. So he's having all these experiences. Of, okay, well, these are experiences of this type. Well, here's where I'm learning more about faith. Here is where I'm learning about the nature of God. This is about the spiritual right. experience itself. But so he went back afterwards and, and put them in an order like that? Yes, and sometimes his index entries are very helpful to translators because they're clearer than what he's indexing. This, this would <laughs> be it a has more light on it you know. to go through. I, just, I can barely make out letters in here, and right. it's not. It's in a different language. I mean, that that's gonna be tough to go in there and figure out. And as we'll right. see when we start to look into these numbers, the subject matter is so obtuse. You just right. you can barely tell what he's talking about, even when you know the word. He's dashing this off for himself, and you can tell he's writing at some haste because sometimes like half a page will be one sentence, and uh, the only thing that's missing are verbs and nouns. Right. Just, that's it. Know, everything else but is there. Everything though. else is there that you need you to understand. You sold me a book. Right. So <laughs> he'll just have a comma, and then a comma, and then a comma, and a comma, and a comma. You know, that's the only punctuation. It's yeah. just commas, and yet they're really what we would think of as separate sentences so it's a very challenging work to edit and translate and he never seems to have intended for this to, to see the light of day this was supposed to be notes to himself or do you it seems so there are a few places where he'll say see whether it include this when i publish this oh really you know so you you there are occasionally things that people have found in here 
where he was debating about whether he would ever publish it. Okay. But no, I, I think mainly, it, I think pretty early on he got rid of any yeah. idea that he was going to oh. publish that. What he does do though, is he will copy these experiences. You can see in both of these volumes we have open in front of us that there are passages that are crossed out. This crossing out means that he copied it somewhere else. So he copied a lot of this into Secrets yes, of Heaven. exactly. Or Arcana Celestia. And, and so he would note it, no, I already got that one. You know, I copied this one over, kind of. So from this collection of Swedenborg's notes, his field notes or notes to himself, let's look at another entry having to do with thought creation and the society of the spiritual world. These next numbers, we actually got to move into the second volume of the spiritual diary. I know that's two because one and three are here, even if you can't tell from the spine. So in here, he goes in depth, in detail, about how each society affects him, what they each want, and you get this really interesting picture of the, cont the contributing factors to individual thoughts. societies in the other life of all qualities whatsoever that could ever come into mankind's thought or desires. Into the thoughts, for example, when I was thinking about some matter that was not being uncovered, but hidden in the word concerning the Ark of Noah. On this occasion, there were societies, one, who were pondering nothing else but whether it should be uncovered, two, whether it is the truth, Three, whether it can be divulged. Most of them were conjecturing whether it is and whether it is so. Very many societies, especially wondering whether it is so, then wandering off into countless details or wandering only into irrelevancies, not entering into of what quality it is. There were very many societies of them that were dispersed, for they hindered the seeing of what it is, getting stuck fast at every turn in this, whether it is, and whenever they were in this, whether so, they were still in whether it is and whether it is so. Therefore, they were wandering about like furies on the outermost skin. There were many, many societies that conjecture egotistically one thus, another thus, in long series. There are societies that do not want the truth to be disclosed, some from indignation that they cannot be the highest, some from unmercifulness, some from apathy, some from the desire that others should investigate the matter from their own effort, as they are doing from theirs. Again, others say that one should persevere in the attempt with no other purpose than that of trying, so that the person or spirit will lose hope, be displeased, become angry, and cast himself headlong into every error and insanity. I spoke with them, saying that such a purpose is diabolical, since nothing is guiding the attempts toward some use besides many other comments about purpose, still others having different views. But the good want to know the truth. They want to teach, want it to be opened up to all. They desire nothing more than to share whatever they know and to free others from temptation and the resulting evil. Thus, there are innumerable societies. Let's dive right into this one. Um, in this scenario, Swedenborg seems to be describing the specifics of what, how these societies interacted with a particular thought. So what, what's he thinking about here? Mm. What I like about this one is that he's pondering the ark and that story in scripture. Yep. And I think he's wondering what it means. Like, what does this detail mean? Why are some of the birds and animals in twos and others are in sevens or yeah. why, you know, what, why is it mentioned this order? Why does it sometimes say the sons and then their wives and then, it, or it's, you know, um, all the different order of things. And it's fascinating to me that into his confusion, uh, pour all these other 
spiritual confusion, you know, from the other world. Some people who don't want him thinking about it. Some people who are sharing their own confusion. Some are sort of saying, well, I think that's a nice idea and tossing yeah. in something good. And I like the thought that there is no thought that happens that is isolated. Like we can't have an isolated thought. Mm -hmm. Somebody else <laughs> has thought it or is think, or in this case is thinking it simultaneously. That's what Swedenborg is saying. And so, you know, just the other day I was playing a certain song on the piano and then I just happened to hear later that somebody else that I knew had been practicing that same song mm. that day and I just thought how many people in the world are playing the same song you know yeah. and in this case <coughs> we have um, you know if you're having a thought and you think you're the only one who's ever thought this you're wrong like he's saying there are just countless people who are actually experiencing that same thought and in that way I feel like you get I feel like this passage in particular feeds itself well into sort of spiritual practice in terms of how you can navigate your own thoughts is first of all, not to think that you're unique for having that thought. So then if you're not unique, then do you really want it, you know, or do you want to pass on that one, you know, mm. or something? So. Right, right. And each of these societies seems to have an agenda. Mm -hmm. it's, they're, they're thinking about it and there's, they want it. The first one wants to just think about, should it be uncovered? We got other ones. Is it true or not? The third one, can it be divulged? Uh, there's all these people that are more concentrating on the thought itself rather than what, what conclusion you'd reach from it. The thinking process itself process, rather than, yeah. Right. Um, and maybe that's, they're just more into that. That's just particular societies that are around them for that. So let's hear about the, uh, the other societies. So there seems to be a lot of this going back and forth about can can it be? Can it not be? And Swedenborg yeah. kind of is against that sort of thinking in a way, right? Mm. That tramping in one place memorable occurrence that he mm. relates is like that, where they want to debate for a hundred years whether this or that mm -hmm. is the case. You know, is this a question? Is there such a thing? Before you even go on to, you know, it's kind of a stuckness. And so, what's amazing to me is that very many of these societies get dispersed. Like, I don't think I'm so lucky. Most of the time, like they don't get dispersed. <laughs> they just hang around in there and raise questions and make me agonize about things and, and, and never move forward. That is, he's describing what underlies our mindsets. Yeah, why do you get in this space where you just are so indecisive? You know, so there's, there are conditions where people are absolutely crippled by the inability to make decisions. Paralyzed. And, and that this may be that these societies get loud and out of balance. And actually, it gives me a little compassion for myself and for the human race that no wonder we're stuck on things. If yeah. we have this much input wandering into countless details and irrelevancies, I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm a proofreader and I get stuck on, but that period, there's two periods at the end of that sentence, you know, which does not affect the content of the sentence at all, but yeah. I get like, so I, I have sympathy for these spirits who yep. are messing us up yes. with too many irrelevancies. <laughs> Proofreader spirits. Yeah. That <laughs> phrase is amazing at the end about wandering about like furies who were these oh, yeah. ancient sort of angry kind of demigods or something who on the outermost skin, you know, they're just ah, they're just raging on the outside of the issue and never getting into well, but what does the arc mean and how does that help us to know it? You know, it just stops on the outermost threshold. I feel like that's kind of reflected in just the internet, you know, like the countless <laughs> just extra, just irrelevancies and just, you know, the, it's Opinions. amazing. The, <laughs> yeah, something amazing to it's ponder. hard to get work done, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so then he, he goes on to describe more societies. Um, these ones more, seemingly more negative they can he says conjecture conjecture egotistically one thus another thus in a long series uh, and then societies who do not want the truth to be disclosed so they're actually trying to keep the truth from getting out so we have sort of these uh these directly um almost sabotaging the thought process for swedenborg yeah i feel like whenever we think about what swedenborg says about sort of where our thoughts come from i feel like it just to me is one of the most useful ideas that I think he brings to the table of spirituality, like that conversation and just that, you know, cause how often we can find ourselves falling into a feeling of just, you know, what he says of, uh, thinking that they should persevere in the attempt with no other purpose than that of trying, you know, we can just find ourselves in this spiral of, Oh, I'm not getting anything done, but I'm just still just trying here. And to know that 
to have a moment of witnessing of like, oh, maybe that's not even me. Maybe there's another option here if I can, you know, get these dispersed and look for it over here, like look for something better over here or who knows. But it just yeah. seems to have a, a way out of our own isolated, you know, sense of ourselves. This but, is tangential. Sorry to cut you off for this. Is, there's no reason for me to make this comment. Once I was having this experience, I was feeling very beset by negative and not negative thoughts and feelings. It, it was just a rough period. And, but I, do, I remember like feeling like, okay, I just don't want to do anything. And I was playing a video game, but I was losing at it. So like, not only was I not doing something in the real world, I was not even accomplishing anything within that false world. And I remember just thinking, this is funny. Like I'm getting absolutely nothing <laughs> done right now. <laughs> so sorry, Jonathan, you were gonna say something. Well, I like the, uh, these people who don't want to share what they've found. They want you to look into it for yourself because, like, hey, yeah. I did the work. I mean, you can do the work yourself, right? You know, so they're not going to yeah. share what we got found. the patent. We're not going to share the medicine. Mm. All right, let's contrast that here to end with the with the good, the ones, the ones who want to know the truth. So, what do they? What's their their purpose is very different from all these other societies, right? Yeah, I love the idea of them. Just there was a different translation of just feeling almost burdened by knowing so much, they just really wanted to share it with other people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so in contrast to that, of wanting to teach, wanting just knowledge to be opened up for everybody, I feel like I know people in my own life who are just so eager about like, oh, I just need to share this thing with you. And it's great. Yeah. yeah. And, and wanting to yeah. free others from temptation yeah. and the resulting mm -hmm. evil. You know, they don't just want to share a good thing, but they want to block the bad thing you know they can see that you're stuck or you're obsessed or whatever it is and they want to get you free yeah mm -hmm. the truth just set you free mm -hmm. doesn't swedenborg says that in the heavenly mindset anything you have you feel like there's no use in it unless it can be someone else's sure. that's right that yeah. heaven is the sharing of joy and of knowledge and that's a pretty radical thought to think I, I have this mental or emotional possession and I'm not, it seems like life is about accumulating those and having those and having better ones than everyone else. But the, the, the heavenly mindset is, I, I don't even care that I have this unless I can pass it on to someone. That, Actually describes cool. it as spiritual avarice okay. to know things and not, not share. Yes. Mm -hmm. And well, I wonder what it is when you share things, but you don't really know them. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we're doing here, right? All right. <laughs> so Swedenborg is meditating on the internal sense of Noah's Ark. And you can, if you've read his first published theological works, it's all about the internal sense of these biblical stories. So here he is trying to fi trying to get insight into what does this mean? What, what are all the characters? What, are the, what does the plot tell us about human development? And as he's doing that, all these spiritual societies are weighing in on the process. But there are differences in the way they approach it. Some of them are really negative, self-focused, and they're trying to sabotage the whole thing. Some are just in the way. They're just gumming up the work. Some are trying to get help him do it and spread information. And is this why our minds are like they are? You can be trying, if you're trying to think of something creative, it can take forever. You're not getting what you want. Why can't I just write this story or this song when is it going to come is it because there's this kind of gridlock and that these these guys have to be dispersed somehow by forces before that works i also think this shows an interesting contrast with these these negative societies and the positive ones these want to keep you just can the process happen no i'm going to stop it but these let's get the information out Let's do what's, let's, who cares about who owns the information? Who cares about how it gets there? What we want to do is let this come out and have it help people. So that's a little microcosm of what is good and what is evil or what is self, negative self-focused and what is this heavenly mindset that these, that these spirits were in that comprised society six. So we're going to take a look at one more number, but before we do that, let's go back to Jonathan Rose and I and just get our one final bit of insight into the, the whole spiritual diary phenomenon and see see how it shows you a little bit of Swedenborg's process in this whole thing. I love the, the spiritual experiences journal because it's such raw data. And yeah, it's a lot of it seems to be the, the basis for things you find in the published works. But here, it's not something you could jump into if this is your first Swedenborg, but once you start to know your way around his world, I find that he, the level of detail he goes into about the spiritual world, how it operates, the kind of things he mentions in there, you can't find anywhere else in his works. And, and sometimes they're the most useful ideas in there. So that's why I yeah. wanted in this show today to look specifically at a couple of numbers here. Yes, he, um, 
it's an amazing work because um, uh, partly just its survival is surprising because he was not sentimental about his manuscript. As soon as the book was published, it was burn it or do whatever, you know, recycle the paper. He, yeah. like, there are no manuscripts to his published works except for a few volumes of Secrets of Heaven where they were published abroad. When he was in Sweden, they were published in England. So he would keep a copy just in case the boat went down and yeah. the manuscript was wow. on. But otherwise, he was not sentimental about his manuscripts. He wouldn't keep stuff. Uh, but this seemed to have ongoing value to him, so he, he kept this, and he kept working on it. He actually wrote the spiritual experiences over a 20-year period, yeah. 1745 to 1765. And that's so, it's just about every day. There, there's entries, or, or at least a few per week. It goes up into the, there's like 5,000, 6,000 entries or something. 6,110, yeah. That's yeah, right. that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive, uh, fascinating piece of work. And I'm glad that it got rescued and saved because uh, it shows you, to me, the most valuable thing. Uh, some people have looked in it for sort of um, like doctrinal information or stuff like that. Sometimes his opinion is changing over time. Mm. Uh, or he's working out what, what, you know, so he'll contradict himself sometimes in here because he's... It's like early entries versus later entries. Uh, yeah, yeah, that he's sort of working on what, what is going on, you know, he's trying to figure it out. Do uh, so you see his progression in here as well? That's right, and to me that's one of the most valuable things is you see his process. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm. And uh, there have been people over time who've said, he didn't have those experiences. He made this up to deceive the public. Yep. Well, to sit down and write thousands of pages, like, that's a pretty, you know... That you don't publish. That's like a sustained, yeah. you know, fakery. You're like, yeah. if you were lying, <laughs> you, you really put your heart into it, you know? So he's like, just in case, after I die, some people come and look through my possessions, I better have covered I my better tracks just by fake writing. a thing with yeah. different handwritings over time. And, yeah. Yeah, and make it look like right, it happened right, right. over a 20-year span. No, he was having these experiences. He was having more than he writes about in the published theological yeah. works. The last one... 4287, where he talks about how, and I can kind of see a little bit of innumerable, uh, kind of see a little bit here, innumerable. He's talking about how different societies go together, centered around a particular concept that we have in mind, in this case, the false concept. So let's see how does what we believe and hold on to affect the kind of spiritual company that we keep. clearly, having spoken with spirits about the matter, and it was acknowledged that a single mental image of falsity engages innumerable societies conspiring together, but all in diverse ways, some directly, some obliquely, some with an evil motive, some with a good motive, some out of malice, some from a good intention, some from ignorance, so that there are innumerable societies that compose a single mental image of falsity, such as those who make faith the essential above charity, or those who place merit in their piety, or in some other way, some in simplicity of heart, some with evil at heart. A person's opinion or assumed principle is like a nucleus. As long as one is captivated by it, all other things are like rays of various colors that complete the mental picture. This was vividly shown to me, and I spoke with those who had been engrossed in this, with others in that mental image, some in front a little toward the right, some above at the back, all having different motives, but still conspiring together. This shows how harmful it is when man or spirit is immersed in falsity. So now that Jonathan's not here, let's let's say what we really think <laughs> about this stuff. Um, here we dive into the same kind of composite thought creation, but he's focusing specifically on a false idea and the contribution of society. He says some interesting things about the different elements that go in and to make that up. What struck you about uh, this particular passage? For me, the first thing that strikes me is that there are good 
there's good coming into it too. Some, right. some are, some of these spirits or societies are throwing in things from a good motive, a desire to be helpful or a, some kind of good intention. Right. So that in my Swedenborgian mindset of, you know, the black and the white, the good and the true, they're always on opposite sides yeah. of the wall. Yeah. That is like, Oh, there's good stuff coming in, even to the falsities. Yeah, doesn't he talk about fa falsities of evil versus falsities from ignorance? Uh -huh. uh, that, right, that good point. You can love something untrue because you have a negative motive, or it just you just don't know. And there's sort of both uh, working, you know, to con to put that thought together. Yeah, and I love that's one of those things that I love about what Swedenborg says, and I feel like it creates such a merciful concept to just not be too, you know, attached to our ideas because. You know, just that for one, angels are just always forgiving us for our misconceptions. You know, like they really are just interested in our in our hearts and how things are going that way. And um, like, if it's all just a misconception, like a falsity, then it's like, all right, we can work with that. You know, like that can get kicked up, that can get broken down and rearranged. On the on the reverse of that, he says some are coming in with an evil motive. Mm -hmm. So it seems like they either they are intentionally trying to sabotage that particular thought or they think that same false thing for an evil reason. Mm -hmm. the, the example he gives is his favorite false example, which is faith separate from charity. Like, okay, what, what else do you got? But he's saying that, that you can have that just because you were kind of taught that and you believe that, or you can have it because you want the dominion of other human beings right. and you know that, that religious stuff is the tool to get that. You know, so there, there's both. Right, right. So I can see a good intention coming toward that thought, like, well, faith is good. I mean, it's nice. Let's let's develop your faith, but let's put it in the right priority or and, something like that. Yeah, and it reminds me of the sort of the the um, uh, cohorts of spirits that Swedenborg describes, where there are some in our show that the three kinds of evil spirits we talk about sirens, and that they were like using other spirits who were educated but sort of self-absorbed and sort of grooming them to say, no, 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 you help us. And they were deceiving simple upright spirits, which again is this like good and evil tangled up together mm. in the sort of middle of the spiritual world. So there is a lot of complexity to the whole thing, but the end result is this, this false idea. This one I, I find particularly mm -hmm. fascinating. Uh, did you have, you guys have, what was your initial reaction to this? Oh, it's just interesting that it's focused on, it's talking about opinion or an assumed principle, like some layer that's somewhat deeper than just an individual thought, mm. but sort of a whole approach to the way that you think and how that can be, you know, particularly harmful if we don't reflect on it and mm. wonder where is, you know, what, where is this coming from? Is this the way, is this the way I want all of my thoughts colored or not? Yeah. Mm. And the, the, it as a nucleus, uh, this is, as long as we're holding on to that, that puts us in a particular spiritual neighborhood mm. and keeps us there. Mm. Um, and that phrase, as long as one is captivated by it. So you can't be freed from the resulting negative impact of these societies in the spiritual world as long as you got that thought because it just puts you right at the center of where they all converge, which I find just potent imagery. Mm. And you can definitely, mm. you know, you, it's hard to see it in yourself. It's easy to see in other people when you think this particular aspect of your mindset has got you stuck in, in some kind of misery. If you could just get rid of that, things would be better, but not so easy sometimes. It's not so easy, yeah. Right, and it seems in contrast a little bit with, you know, the, we know the importance of people's intentions and motives, but then this is saying how, like, getting immersed in some particular way of thinking can really cause some harm. I don't want to say dangerous thing, but it can be where it's just like, it's worth it to be trying to you know, change the way we think, I guess, or, you know, just to think about that. Um, yeah, well, he does say this shows how harmful it is mm -hmm. at the end. So he, he is warning, and I think it's a warning against rigidity because he's talking mm -hmm. about the more we're captivated by it, it's going to be hard to know, are my assumptions about life true or false? But there is a blanket philosophy you can apply, which is don't be too sure about right. anything. Right. It seems like because he uses this language, captivated by it, whatever the original wording is, but it makes me seem like you're just enthralled or you idolize this particular principle. It's unassailable, but it seems like the more loose we are about our beliefs, the less chance we have of getting caught in this web that then mm -hmm. you can't sort of see out of. So, you know, chill. Chill. Yep. Very challenging. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can imagine it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not the same as doing it. No. I'm so intrigued by the section title, the 
how innumerable societies conspire toward a single principle of falsity, thus how much there is in a single mental image. Thought is the image of the person. I feel like he doesn't come back to that. He throws that in there. Thought is the image of the person. So I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Um, it may be that if, you know, he talks about societies looking like a person, mm -hmm. right? So it's got to be, collect if, if the, the, the human form can kind of show up on all levels, it's got to be that collections of societies can also look like a person. And this particular collection of societies is held together by this one principle in the middle. So maybe the that, that creates the image of, of this person centered around that, which is you, because this is your... You, we are all the, our individual crossroads in the spiritual world. So right. something like that, but who knows? Uh, who knows what's really going on? And that can feed into, you know, the the idea of substance and form. You know, that thought is the form of feeling, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. our unique, you know, the unique way that we as individuals can think is is really what creates the person that we look like in the spiritual world. In that one, you see the power of a thought, in this case, a negative thought, and how having that, and we grab onto it and don't let go, that changes who we're interacting with spiritually. That thought for, for that Swedenborg is describing was acting as this nexus uh, that everything else revolves around and interacts with, and that you can't be freed from it as long as you're holding on to it, and that, that it attracts these things, it gets all wrapped up. To me, it's a powerful image of the, the, the power a concept can have over you in the way that it can just get you stuck. It's, it's just a little bit of data that we've been looking at here, but is, is this useful psychological information? If he's describing what the subconscious actually is, which is the whole spiritual world, is, can that create a better model for why human thought processes are like they are? Who knows? We're not going that far tonight. We just wanted to show you some of it. If you want to scan his spiritual diary or journal, spiritual experiences, there's plenty more in there that, that you can find. It's a fascinating read, the whole thing, but you've got to get a little bit used to what Swedenborg is talking about before it's going to make much sense. Hope you've enjoyed that journey here with us. Great having you. Uh, like and subscribe if you want to um, make this something as weird as this shoot out across the internet and hopefully it comes to the right person and, and uh, it was just what they're looking for. So we appreciate it. And also, if you want to make weird programming like this possible, we're a nonprofit. We run off donations. Here's a little bit about who we are and why we do what we do. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com, and we produce this show and other content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. The only way to keep this up, though, is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving to give. If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. That's our show for this week. Really appreciate you making it this far. And next week, we're going to be doing an all question and answer show. So if this content has spurred any questions and you get ready next Monday. We're going to answer them or if you have questions about anything else, we'll spend the whole hour just doing that back and forth feedback thing. Hope to see you there. Uh, thanks for, for taking this weird journey here tonight. <laughs>